Good morning, and I believe we are live. Welcome to Beyond the Fundamentals. There goes the chat. <laughs> so, I see some funny things in the chat already. Some terms of endearment floating around in the chat. Today we are talking about the term pistis out of Acts 1731. The term pistis is... Somebody said, as an unbeliever, this confuses me. All right. Well, this is going to be a this is going to be a, a good episode for an unbeliever. So, welcome aboard, Sarah. Um, Pistis in Acts seventeen thirty one is a very strange uh, occurrence. Not strange, really. I'm looking over here to try to get my bearings on where I want to go with this. So, if I were to bring up the word, the verse in Acts seventeen thirty one. Just to remind us of what we're looking at from previous sessions, Paul is in the middle of Athens, and he is um, looks like I'm missing some uh, some words over here. You might not be able to see. I'm going to fix that for you. All right, there we go. So Paul's in the middle of Athens, and he's talking to some fools, and he's telling them. He's appealing to their poets, and he starts talking about this unknown God. And he says, God that made the world and all things therein, seeing he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands. And I want to say right off the bat, when you start, it, every, <laughs> piston, yeah, every, pistis is the piston of our salvation. It's a funny sounding word. Every concept or model that you have of God in your head is essentially an idol. And when when stage three atheists are rejecting the God of Christianity, what they are rejecting essentially, they, in my opinion, they are rightly rejecting the false model of God that we are, we have built in our heads and that we are projecting out into the world. We don't have enough of an exploratory approach, enough of an exploratory avenue of approach or vector or attitude toward our concept of God. Our concept of God needs to be more fluid and it needs to have a very high appreciation for all the things that we cannot possibly know. And I can't stress that enough. Thanks for the super chat from Jamie who says, keep it up. I can't stress that enough. So, and, and I think that the false models that we have of God are contributory toward the rampant atheism that is just a response to the fundamentalist type of narrow-minded, non-exploratory concept of God that we have in our mind. Okay. Somebody said, I can't remember where I heard this, but this, this journey toward following God is one that's never complete and one that's always just starting, okay? And every every morning when you wake up as a Christian, it's 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 a shame really in my opinion that we have seminaries that give out degrees, all right? Because you wind up you wake up and you think that you've got something under your belt. But what you have no idea about is that the enormity that is God, the you have to have what's called a higher ignorance knowing the things, understanding the things that you can't possibly know, like understanding that you cannot count to infinity. I watched a movie recently with my family and there was a brother and sister arguing and they were throwing insults back and forth at each other. And one of them said an insult times infinity and the other one said an insult times infinity squared. Well, that's kind of funny, but obviously you can't really square infinity. And we, we tend to think of God as... Uh, something that we can quantify, something that we can capture in some kind of theology or statement of faith or something like that. We cannot. It is this ever-changing, uh, dynamomorphic type of existence that we explore, we constantly explore. And the, uh, the point of interface with God can never be recaptured again and it's always a new and a fresh. And all you can do is increase your points of interface with whatever God is. 
how yeah i'm i'm also wondering what uh what f m o g stands for somebody said that uh f m o g fmog should be a common acronym on this channel i don't know what that means huh <laughs> So they've got this idol, and, and Paul is trying to expand them. False model of God. Yeah. Instead of calling out someone's Calvinist uh, baloney, we should call out false model of God. That's right. So, yeah, Calvinism is just one instantiation. Calvinism is just one instantiation of a false model of God. And what I've been trying to point out is that each one of us also create commits the same error as having a false model of God, and that constantly has to be shaken up. So you can't just oppose Calvinism and be correct. You can't just oppose anything and be correct, whether it's the Baptists or the Methodists or Jehovah's Witnesses or Mormons. You think that you oh I've got some I can I can pinpoint their wrong propositions and run it against a formula of what I perceive to be correct propositions. Well, your formula of correct propositions, that is your false model of God. All right. And no matter who you are, what you believe. So we have to let go of those things. And I'm not talking about this, let go and let God fully rely on God stuff. Ugh. I'm talking about like, you have to let go of your attachment to your sets of propositions about what you think God is because he is not those things. So, the God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands. Now, however that happened, okay? Neither is worshipped with men's hands as though he needed anything, seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things. Now, all things giveth all things. Now, notice what comes next. Verse 31, right? And hath made of one blood all nations and men for to dwell on the face of the earth, and hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation, that they should seek the Lord, if happily they might feel after him, and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. Now last session we pointed out that all over the world at the time there were some people looking for Messiah, and there were some people looking for the Logos <coughs> over in the west, and there were some people over in the east looking for the light. And all in John chapter 1, all in John chapter 1, we find out that Jesus is the Logos, Jesus is the Messiah, and Jesus is the light, okay? And at the risk of being called out as a heretic, I have been reading a book called, hmm, I've been reading a book by Richard Rohrer lately called Universal Christ, where... As far as I've gotten so far, there is an equation of Christ with consciousness itself, with light. This is that light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. Well, what is that light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world? Will be consciousness. In the same anointing ye have, ye need not that any man teach you. Ye have an unction from the Holy One, and ye know all things. The same consciousness is there. Now, uh, I think that's interesting. It's kind of light reading, so for those of you who are like still working your way through McGilchrist and stuff like this, this is something that you can read a lot faster and a lot easier um, if you want to jump on that bandwagon. A lot easier than stages of faith and that kind of thing. Some of this technical stuff that we've been reading. <clears throat> and hath made of one blood all nations for to dwell on the face of the earth and hath determined uh, the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation that they should seek the Lord if happily they might feel after him and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. For in him we live, move, and have our being, as certain also of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. Now, in him, we he's talking to lost people when he says that. Don't you think that's interesting? You ever read Colossians chapter 3? Um... where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, Scythian, bond free, but Christ is all and in all. Christ is all and in all. That's very interesting. Very interesting concept. All right. And there's concepts like this all throughout the New Testament. If you were to separate them out and not put a scripture reference with it and just quote it, you would get labeled as some kind of panentheist, uh, crazy person, heretic, right? 
For in him we live, move, and breathe, and have our being. As also of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. For then as much as we are the offspring of God, he's talking to lost people here, we ought not to think of, God, of the Godhead that is like unto gold or silver or stone or graven by art and man's device. And I would also add on to that or any concept of God that you have in your head. I would carry that further into mental constructs of God. We don't build gods out of, say, gold, silver, or stone, but we build gods out of things like this. And then we worship those gods instead of the true God. Um, you, have to, you have to keep mixing it up when it comes to your concept of God so you don't get stuck on any one and you'll be worshiping a false idol. So then as much then as we the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the God has likened to gold, silver, stone, graven by art, man's device, or systematic theology, or any concept or set of concepts that man can come up with to try to contain the idea of God, to uh, get a grip on it so that we can manipulate it, right? Or get um, apprehension. We're trying to get apprehension of God, right? And that's a left hemispheric thing to try to get apprehension of something. It's a right hemispheric thing to get comprehension of something, right? We need to stay in the right hemisphere, not so much in the left hemisphere. The, this kind of stuff, systematic theology, this is not good, okay? This is not good at all. This is, this is the left hemisphere domination, usurpation over the right hemisphere, trying to get apprehension of God without comprehension of God. Now, when you try to comprehend God, you're going to realize that trying to comprehend infinity is, is an ongoing process that you're never going to have apprehension of, right? It's something in which you live, move, and breathe, and have your being. In the times of this ignorance, God winked, winked at or winced at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent, because he hath appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men, in that he hath raised him from the dead. Now, the word I want to click on is this word assurance. Hath given assurance unto all men. Now, if I double click on this word assurance, it takes me to the Greek word underlying it, pistis. Now, what you may not, that's a funny sounding word, right? But if you've ever heard the word epistle or epistemology, okay? It shares the same root as pistis. Pistis is the same word that is translated as faith or belief, right, or variations of those words, uh, 239 times in your New Testament. So every time you're looking at the word faith or belief, now abideth these three things, faith, hope, and love, and the greatest of these things is love, right? Well, the faith there is pistis. That's the, that's the Greek word. And it just so happens that that's the same word, hath given pistis unto all men. And that he hath raised him from the dead. And when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked, and others said, We will hear thee again of this matter. So Paul departed from among them. Why do some mock? Right? Why do some mock? Because the Athenians, the Athenians did not have a left hemisphere model of a resurrection. So when you start mentioning something that does not fit their left hemisphere model, there's no way to encounter novelty and update the model to account for a resurrection. All they can do is mock, right? Now, the same thing, same time anybody's caught in a left hemispheric model, that's what people tend to do. They're very hesitant. They're not very good at updating their model with encountering novelty and updating the paradigm. They're typically pretty bad about that. Um, and so the left hemisphere creates a model of reality which it is completely convinced is right and it's it, it does not like to update it and it overlays that model on top of reality so it prefers theory over reality it prefers the map over the terrain it prefers the paradigm over novelty it it prefers these things so when when you're re, like if you're a Calvinist and you're reading the Bible, right? You're reading the words on this page, but the theory here is being overlaid onto this and you don't even know it's happening. So you think that you're 
Calvinism, or if you're a provisionist, you think that your provisionism is being bolstered as you're reading this, when really the systematic theology that is shaping your salience landscape is bolstering the map for you. And so what happens with the left hemisphere is it does not have a it does not encounter a presentation of the world like the right hemisphere does. It only it only deals with a representation of the world, a representation of the world. Okay, so in other words, if you're left hemispheric, you cannot, you actually cannot, technically read your Bible. The words enter your mind, and the left hemisphere projects a left hemispheric created model onto what you are encountering. And that's what you see coming into your head. So if you're a provisionist, that's what you see coming into your head. You don't actually see the words of the text or the meaning, and you're not encountering it anew. You have to try to break the frame on purpose to get out of the model that you are in in order to see the, fresh the, the text afresh. That's why I said earlier that the following God is a journey that's never complete and it is always starting fresh. And every time you go to scripture, you should never have an overlay such as, you know, dispensationalism or covenantal theology or mid-acts. Dis you should never have an overlay like that through which you are seeing the text. You should always very intentionally try to be seeing it afresh for the first time, regardless of where it leads. And you will be surprised where it leads. And when you, one of the things that helps you do this is to read things from people of other perspectives. Okay, So I'm reading this book by Richard Rohr. He's a Franciscan monk. He is not an independent fundamental Baptist. And if he were to say five sentences in an independent fundamental Baptist church, he might not make it out alive. Okay? But as I'm listening to him talk, I can see a different perspective in how he could read the same words that I read as an independent Baptist, getting one thing out of him, and he's getting something completely different. But I can see how he would get that from a different perspective. And what that does is it helps me shake, it helps me shake out of the frame that I am in because I presume that I'm locked into frames I don't understand that I'm locked in. You have to understand that I, I presume that about myself as I recommend that you presume about yourself all the time. And so seeing somebody else's perspective shakes me out of my frame and I don't necessarily have to jump laterally over to his, but now I freed up enough to maybe get the meta frame to where I can get a higher frame where I can see both of them and I don't have to be emotionally attached to either one. Now, we've talked about before, if you were to look at the cross section of a cylinder, a cylinder is a, I'm trying to see if I got a cylinder laying around me somewhere. <laughs> a cylinder is like, here's a, I got a coffee cup here. It's kind of a cylinder, right? If I were to give you a cross section of a cylinder, long ways, it would look like a rectangle in two dimensions. If I give you the cross section short ways, it would look like a circle in three dimensions. When I put a rectangle next to a circle, you would think those two aren't compatible. In two dimensions, they aren't, but in the third dimension, they are. So I can look at my independent Baptist upbringing, then I can look at Richard Rohr's writings, and they don't seem compatible, but when I go to a higher level in the meta, add some dimensionality to it, wow. Now I can see that they were both uh, striving to point at something poorly, kind of like the blind men trying to tell what an elephant is when they can only feel it and can't see it. And maybe you think the elephant's leg is a tree trunk, right? Um, well, when you understand that it's not a tree trunk and that it's an elephant, you can read descriptions of the tree trunk and still understand more about the elephant. Does that make sense? You need to be able to do that. So when we talk about exercising rule omega and trying to hear the thing that's trying to be said, we've got to realize that we're all blindly groping around like these guys. Um, verse 26, And hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell upon the earth, and hath determined the times before appointed that they should seek the Lord if happily they might feel after him. Notice that feel after him. It's like there's a blindness that you can't, you can't quite see. And find him, though he be not far from every one of us. Kind of like these blind men trying to 
tell what an elephant is just by feeling it, okay? And um, so you, whenever you're reading a theologian especially, a friend of mine recently said that <laughs> theologians are like third-rate philosophers, right? And that's kind of true. I mean, yeah, I, I, I don't get a lot out of theologians these days unless they're of a like vastly different tradition than what I'm from. And then sometimes I get some, uh, I get some things that force me to a meta dimensionality, force me to consider some other things, which I love by the way, highly recommend some other people be trying to do that. Um, let me see where we are on comments somewhere. Yeah, we have, uh, yeah, so Sarah says, I have a question. I don't mean to be rude, but is there proof of God? All right. And so, yeah, we do have a video called Gospel for Atheists. And what we're trying to do here, Sarah, is we're trying to say that when somebody talks about proof of God, they're usually talking about a proof of a particular model of God. All right. But the way we're looking at God is like we are here and whatever is at the top of the reality hierarchy of what is here we reserve the label god for that and we don't understand what is at the top of it but we got here somehow so whether you think whether anybody thinks um whether they're convinced of scientism or of a particular creation myth or something like that we got here somehow or maybe we were you know panspermia maybe aliens put us here whatever process led to us being here um there is some structure to it. There is some. There is a hierarchy to reality, and there is a value hierarchy which brings meaning to life if you live it in a certain way. And we think that that value hierarchy is best represented in the narrative of the person of Jesus of Christ, uh, Jesus of Nazareth. He is he is the archetypal um, prime example of that value hierarchy of in love. Um, and, and by the way, Sarah, if you can look at any time anything good has ever happened by anybody, whether they're atheist or not, the pattern is that in love, they voluntarily adopt responsibility and bear the cost of something that isn't their fault. And then they, that, that cost could cost them like in case of Christ, it cost them his life, but then there's a resurrection cycle. So there's this, there's this pattern to meaning in life which involve which includes that anytime anything meaningful happens that is what has happened to a bigger or smaller scale maybe it happens on a societal scale maybe it happens on a personal scale okay maybe uh there would be there would have been no regard <laughs> maybe there would have been no enlightenment of any kind or no actual revolution or no science as we know it if socrates hadn't drunk and hadn't drunk the hemlock right Maybe something like that. There's this pattern that exists everywhere. Now we don't know what God is and we don't want to put a particular model on him. So if, if you wanted to prove God, you're thinking, you're thinking in scientism terms and you're probably thinking of uh, physical objective reality description type terms of which you can prove a particular model of God. Well, we, we don't advocate aligning oneself with any particular model of God. We advocate aligning oneself with reality and understanding the hierarchical nature of reality. And we reserve the term God for whatever is at the top of that. And we, are, we, we will be forever in higher ignorance about what that is. So any attempt to prove any particular God would be an exercise in idolatry. And any, and any attempt to disprove would be the same exercise in idolatry and a disrespect to the world in which you find yourself. Okay. Um, maybe the word God is throwing you off because of how it's used all the time in society. Somebody said, I don't want to be shaken up by Richard Rohr. I'm not mature enough to go another round with him. Well, I'm just getting started on my round. Thanks for the increased super chat, Jamie, for the additional super chat. If you love God, then God exists. If not, then not. If your model of God is always wrong, 
then how can one ever love God or is loving pieces of God sufficient? So that's, so what you, I was just thinking of that, Kayla, because in my, in my Baptist background, everyone's always talking about when they pray, Lord, we love you. And like, and I know they don't love God. They love a model of God. And they love God, they love their model of God because they're put into a double bind. Something like, in order to be good, you have to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul, and strength. But you can't really do it because you're told to. You kind of have to do it without, not because you have to, but because you want to. So people are virtue signaling, trying to convince themselves that they want to love this being, which winds up actually being a model of God, which is not God. So can you love God? And I think what you're, what you're dealing with right there, Kayla, this question, your model of God, that is like a Zen koan, which is, <laughs> this is the kind of question. If your model of God is always wrong, then how can, you, how can one ever love God? That is like a Zen koan. It's an unanswerable question. And that's, that's the point. The point there are many places in the Bible, in my opinion, where you're, the idea is to struggle with it enough to realize that the thing can't be done. And when you realize that the thing can't be done and that there is a higher level order way to approach this, that is one step closer to the light, you know, the Light is a Bible word, and being enlightened is a Bible concept and phrase. And you're one step closer when you realize that that is an unanswerable question. What is love? Magic, mindfulness, attention, goodwill, intention, compassion, kindness. Uh, another way to say what is love, perhaps the idea that being is worthwhile, and therefore more well-being is worthwhile. And something else, another definition of love is uh, the affordance of choice. How does one love the invisible God? Yeah, if, you, if you're trying to force yourself to love an invisible image of something you've never met, the point is that you grow up to the point where you realize that cannot be done. So we have this word pistis over here. Pistis. And this word, pistis, shows up here as assurance. And I want to introduce you to a dialogue that I had with a Calvinist that, and it's not, it's not just that we're bashing Calvinism here, because that's not the point, but the model of faith that the Calvinist has is, represents the same problems with the model of faith that typical left hemispheric evangelical Christians have, whether they're provisionists or otherwise, Okay. <clears throat> Seraphim said, but even one's false model of God is a necessary stage of growth toward understanding and loving a true model of God, which will forever be approaching. One cannot know the truth without first having known falsity. And I think there's some truth to that. There is a, there are stages that, uh, where the concept needs a place filler for your mind, for what your mind can handle at any, at any given time or what your maturity level can handle. At any given time. <laughs> I'm not going to sing that song. Um, with regard to faith, I think this dialogue that I had with a Calvinist. By the way, we have a video on the faith crisis. And I highly recommend you watch our video. on the, We have two videos, part one and part two. I highly recommend you watch that. I highly recommend you watch the Mammon Church video. Perhaps before you watch the faith crisis, but even if afterwards, because we have a very different approach here on Beyond the Fundamentals than what you're going to find on other so-called Christian channels or ministries, all right? So there was a Facebook post, by the way, last week was our Jesus Lord Light, Logos Light Lord video, which um, has begun, been getting a lot of positive feedback. So you might want to go back and watch that video if you've not seen it yet. I'd highly recommend that. We had a Calvinist post on Facebook. And here's what the Calvinist said. And now you have to also understand that Calvinists have, 
you have to get this that Calvinists have this built in part of their meme complex that faith is a gift, right? In other words, they believe in total depravity and they can't have anybody just having faith in Christ without God overcoming their total depravity on their behalf and essentially forcing them, irresistible grace, forcing them to have faith, right? So because of that, that comes from stuff like this, this, is, this advocates Calvinism, by the way, when they see the word faith, they are triggered to their systematic theology and then every time they have this doctrine of faith faith is a gift and it's affirmation of certain propositional facts now all that's crazy and then and then every time the word faith shows up they impose all of that onto the appearance of that word but what we have to get is that no bible writer ever wrote in service to a systematic theology that was propositionally oriented. Or I could just put the period at any systematic theology. We tend to think that all the writers of the Bible have this concept of faith in mind, or whatever the doctrine is you're dealing with, justification, redemption, adoption, that they have this overarching concept in mind, and that whenever they use that word, that they are appealing to that systematic doctrine, that dogma that we have learned in Christian history since then. And that is not the case at all. It is never the case. And what you have to get in your head with regard to biblical interpretation. In one sense, you have to forget the words that they are using because of how our society has turned these words into loaded terms okay these loaded terms because our society has turned them into loaded terms we tend to bring that loading onto what the text says we have to clear our minds of all of that and the main thing that you're looking for are you're looking for points that are being made in the context and you want that point to be understood in such a way to where you could restate that point using all completely different words. And when you can do that, then you might be somewhat closer toward um, what, the, what the writer had in mind. Now bear in mind, there, are, there could be, for any passage, there could be multiple different levels of meaning, not to be confused with the application, which is different than the meaning. Okay, What do I mean by that? The meaning, for example, of the, the literal meaning of Abraham taking his son up to, up to uh, on the top of the mountain to sacrifice his son. The literal meaning of the text is that Abraham took his son up there to sacrifice him. It's a literal meaning. It's a narrative event. It's telling you what happened. But there's an application to this. There's many applications to this. There's one meaning. That's what he did. But there are many applications, like maybe it applies like I should be willing to sacrifice um, something very important to me if I'm truly willing to follow God. That could be an application. Maybe a deeper meaning is if you look at the Bible as a whole, you see that this is a pattern type of Christ happening here and it's trying to point you to something. Okay, So get, when you get a chance, Google the Four different layers of meaning that you know different Christian traditions call them different things at different times but you might want to come become familiar with those and also don't confuse meaning necessarily with application because application is what you want to do about it and there could be lots of those there could be lots of applications for any particular passage there when it comes to the literal meaning there's one literal meaning but there could be other types of meanings associated with the passage and you want to be well-versed and get practice in being able to draw as many of those out of any text as you possibly can. So <clears throat> just because the word faith, you have a loaded, you have a doctrine that is associated with the word faith or with the word election or with the word predestination. Every time those words show up, you bring that whole doctrine as your baggage with you and you overlay that onto the text. What you're doing to the Bible is essentially the same thing as somebody who gets married to a new partner and they bring a whole bunch of baggage with them from their previous life and they have all these fears or all these beliefs 
and or maybe it's from their parents, maybe it's from their ex-spouse, something like that, and they overlay all of that baggage, all that emotional baggage onto their new spouse in, in with regard to expectations, beliefs, um, fears, they overlay that onto their new spouse without recognizing that perhaps their, their new spouse is none of those things, right? When, <clears throat> when we fill our minds with systematic theology, it's, it's like entering into a marriage with as much baggage as you could possibly bring with you to overlay onto your spouse that is not fair to the spouse. We do not need to bring this baggage to this book, right? You need to treat this book like a new marriage and you want to clear all that baggage out and don't hold this book responsible for all that garbage because this book didn't do all that. That's not how it's presented. So when you see the word faith, do not think of all your overlay paradigmatic concepts of faith and your doctrines of faith. Don't think of those at all. What you want to think about is the point that's trying to be made in the text that you're reading, and then see if you can make that point using completely different words than are in the text, like none of those buzzwords, okay? That might be something that you might find helpful. So this Calvinist made a post, and he said, <clears throat> For those who say faith is an innate capability in all men to believe in something, what does God mean by these scripture? He probably meant to say scriptures. This is a direct cut and paste. All right. So sick on that. Now, when he says believe in something, he's probably thinking of propositional doctrines listed as facts that people bring into reality by affirming them. That is not what the Bible means by belief. All right. So we're, so what we're going to do in this, and, and, and I'm not just picking on a Calvinist here because there are people who might say that. And so a provisionist would be wrong for the same idea, okay? So it's any kind of stage three paradigmatic, propositionally, you know, um, tyrannized person. And when I say propositionally tyrannized, I'm talking about the four kinds of knowing here. So if you're new to the channel, you need to understand the four kinds of knowing to know where I'm coming from on that. So he quotes 2 Thessalonians 3.2. And he said, I will hide my face from them, and I will see what their end shall be. Or, I mean, here he's quoting Deuteronomy 32, 20. She, what their end shall be, for they are a very, a very froward generation, children in whom is no faith. Now, here's a very interesting thing in your Bible that you may not realize without this being pointed out to you. The word faith or belief, pistis, shows up, I think, 239 times in your New Testament, okay? <laughs> The word faith, at least in the King James Bible, in the Old Testament, in the Tanakh, the Torah and the Devim, the Ketuvim, shows up twice. Twice. And in Deuteronomy 32, 20, it says, children in whom is no faith. Well, that's interesting. Okay. And the second time it shows up is in Habakkuk 2, 4, where it says, the just shall live by his faith. That's the famous passage that gets quoted in the New Testament several times where it says the just shall live by faith. But in the Old Testament, the quotation is the just shall live by his faith. And then here you have children in whom is no faith. That's only two times in 39 books of the Bible. <laughs> okay. And then you, in the last 27, it shows up 239 times. So the idea of faith um, is that... The pistis, faith, belief kind of thing shows up a lot in the New Testament. Does not show up a whole lot like it does in the New Testament in the Old Testament. The word faith shows up twice. Now there's faithfulness. There's that kind of thing. But the word faith itself. And that's, that's kind of a clue on what, you, what I want you to think about here. And then he goes on to say that we may be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men. For all men have not faith. So this is the Calvinist saying, well, we believe faith is a gift to all people. And here I have proof that not all people have received that gift. Really, their real doctrine, they would never state it this way. But what they really believe is that faith is something that is withheld from some people. And that faith is some magical thing that God gives people to affirm certain facts. And people who don't affirm those facts have no faith. That's not faith. 
It's not faith anyway. And the funny thing is, for the people who claim that faith is a gift only given to certain people, um, what it, what faith really is, they're maybe the only ones who don't have it, which is ironic. It's funny how, you know, sometimes it'd be like that. Now remember that if you say it's faith in Christ, the passages are referring the passage are referring to then it would mean, this is the, still the Calvinist talking here, anywhere in the scripture the word faith is used, it's faith in Christ. Now that is that sickness coming in to where they're taking a doctrine and every time a word shows up, they bring that doctrine in with it. Listen, words mean absolutely nothing without context. Nothing. You do not bring in a definition to a word and stick it in any context. You never do that. Never, ever, never, ever. Never do that, okay? That is the exact wrong thing to do. <clears throat> so he, that's his thinking. If Well, if you say it's this, then that means every time the word shows up, it's that. No, it never means that. It, it, there is no one meaning that, that applies to every wor any word in every context that's used. Words have a semantic range. And also, the semantic range, even, you can even use a word completely divorced from its semantic range friends nobles countrymen lend me your ears you ever listen to that um i forget which shakespeare play that is but he goes through and uh after i think it's julius caesar after they kill julius caesar um one of the guys i think his name starts with an a and it's leaving my head right now i'm sure sheriff seraphim will put it in the chat they start talking about surely these were honorable men. Surely these were honorable men. Honorable men. Well, the word, the meaning of the word honorable is a good thing, but the way it's being used in the context, there, he, it actually means the opposite of what the word means because of the context. Context is everything. Is everything. Words are nothing without context. For throughout the scripture, the word, the word faith is used in the same way. Now, that is absolutely an asinine thing to say. That is, that is never... So, he's still thinking of mapping a systematic theological dogma onto every occurrence of a single word. You never, ever do that with any word ever. So, this is really a practicum and biblical interpretation here. It would mean not all men have the capability to believe in Christ. Why would it mean that? By the way, could you believe in Christ if Christ wasn't there yet? And if uh, if this is that light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world, hmm. Then he says, but if you're just saying you only believe that all men have the innate capability to have faith, can you give me a, a clear scripture for that? I mean clear, not implied. So what's he doing? He's creating a false dichotomy that it either has to be this or this, or, <clears throat> or this, or that it's an innate capability. So it's one, two, or three. Those are your three options. There's 31,102 verses in the Bible, and he's only giving you three options. That's retarculary, okay? That's extremely remedial way of thinking. That's a very one-dimensional way of thinking. The square, the rectangle and the circle cannot possibly be the same. So I replied to him. I said, it looks like you're trying to capitalize on a semantic argument that can be made from the word in, in Deuteronomy 32.20, which is complete bad faith sophistry. No pun intended. Because he's saying, no, in whom is no faith. Like, faith is not in them, therefore, faith has not been given to them, therefore, it is with, it's a gift that's withheld from some people, is what he's getting at. That's what I'm pointing out. So I continued, not only had the resurrection which gives pistis of Acts 17.31 not happened yet, what am I talking about? The word pistis over here, which gives faith unto all men. Because what I'm doing is I'm Proverbs 26, 24, 4 and 5, 20, Proverbs 26, 4 and 5. He has the premise that faith is a gift. And so even though... In one sense, yes, because everything is a gift. Life and breath and everything is a gift. But he thinks it's a particular gift that's like given to some people, withheld from some people. So since we can only deal with one thing at a time, I'm not going to address whether or not it's a gift, a universal gift or a particular gift. I'm going to 
allow his premise to stand for a second and address it as it is, which maybe that's a, um, <laughs> it, a technique that maybe you want to try one day. Okay. So this assurance here, pistis, faith, belief, faithfulness, fidelity had never happened yet. But the context, so not only had the resurrection, which gives the pistis of Acts 17.31 to everyone, not happened yet, but the context, yes, context and Calvinism never go together. What do I mean by context? Well, he had just quoted from Deuteronomy 32.20. Well, if you back up to Deuteronomy 32.18, it says, Of the rock that begat thee, thou art unmindful, and hast forgotten that God formed thee. So then I pointed out, my words here, the people in whom was no faith were begotten of God and forgot him. Now, I know that people aren't regenerated in the Old Testament, but I have to, talk, I have to meet the Calvinist where he is, you see? And I understand that being begotten of God is with regard to the nation of Israel, not any individuals being supernaturally spiritually regenerated. But they, I, I can only deal with one overlay at a time. To them, begotten of God is this supernatural John 3 type stuff every time. So I'm like, well, they were begotten of God and they forgot him and now they have no faith. Well, there goes perseverance of the saints. So I'm pointing out contradictions in his own paradigm. That's what I'm doing here, which all lead from his, um, his paradigmatic overlay. So then I went to Galatians 3 and I pointed this out. Galatians 3, but before faith came, we were kept under the law, shut up under the faith, which should afterwards be revealed. Now, this makes a whole lot of sense if you realize that faith shows up huh, two times in the Old Testament and 239 times in the New Testament. Wherefore, the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ that we might be justified by faith. But after that faith is come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster. So, what I was pointing out here, what I'm pointing out here, is that there is a before and after component to the coming of faith. Well, if you look at, um, where is it, Acts 17.31, well, that makes a whole lot of sense. Because if that assurance given to all men is that he hath raised up Christ from the dead, well, that's, uh, that's the very specific time that the object of faith came. So I told him, you're mapping the appearance of a word back to a paradigmatic formula like this, instead of engaging in open-ended exploration of the text in the context in which it appears. So I continued. Now there's a bunch that I'm leaving out of this, because when you're dealing with somebody online, it's Sometimes it's just crazy messy, but I'm giving you some Cliff's Notes highlights here. And these are good things to remember for the sake of biblical interpretation. So I said context is a primary component of interpretation. We don't take a definition or meaning of a word, then impose that, uh, and then override the context, impose that to override the context in which it appears. With regard to the word faith, you are operating from a paradigm that needs this concept to fit a specific gift narrative. Faith is given as a gift to people in which your belief structure hinges on which. Yeah. But in scripture, so in other words, you know that a Calvinist needs faith to be a gift and it needs to be withheld from some people because their, their paradigmatic narrative demands that. Therefore, every interpretation they offer of any passages of any passage will be in service to that narrative. You know that a priori before examining the passage, and so do they. So that's why we call it simulated thinking. There's no thinking that goes on. There's nobody trying to figure out the text. There's somebody trying to figure out what's the most clever post hoc rationalization I can come up with to map it back to the paradigm that I already believe. That's all a Calvinist does. That's all a provisionist does. That's all any kind of ismist -ist person does. And you can, you can basically answer on their behalf if you know what their system is. That's why whenever you get into a discussion with these guys, they're like, where do you come from? Where do you, what, what, what's your label? What's your denomination? What, what? Why? Why are they doing that? Because they don't know how to encounter novelty and suss it out in real time. 
they have to they ha- they're, they're trying to tap into their prefabricated answers for you file that they have for you. And as soon as you say that you're a XYZ, bam, they don't have to talk to you anymore. They have a file of prefabricated answers they will start pulling out of their mind and overlaying on top of you. Right? That's simulated thinking. Subhuman cognition. And the reason as soon as a Calvinist asks you what your background is or what your denomination is or what your set of beliefs are, uh, it's because they can't think. They've never been able to think. Um, all right? But in Scripture, so he's, he's looking to map the word faith uh, to a specific gift narrative on which his belief structure hinges. But in Scripture, it's not like that. Sometimes faith is a reference to the content of all that is believed, and that could be procedural, perspectival, or participatory, all right? And it could be the, like, Christianity as a whole, the faith, just the concept of Christianity, right? Sometimes it's, uh, I said revenge, but this is supposed to be, I type some of this stuff from my phone. Sometimes it's a reference to the object of faith, right? Put, in other words, Christ is the object of our faith, right? So you can't have an object in which to put your faith if there is no object of the faith, right? Sometimes it's fidelity to something of valued concern. Sometimes it's relational. Sometimes it's propositional. Sometimes there's an affirmational component to it. Sometimes it's procedural. Sometimes it's perspectival. Sometimes it's participatory. And sometimes it's dispositional. Each passage would need to be examined in order to see which faith is used. So this whole idea, where is that, 19? This whole idea that anywhere scripture used the faith, it would be this one thing. Never, ever, never, ever. That is the opposite of biblical interpretation. That is eisegesis. That is taking a meaning and overlaying it onto. That's to put exegesis is to draw the meaning out of the text. Let the text tell you what it means. Eisegesis is to take a meaning from outside text and overlay it onto the text like bad baggage from a previous marriage coming into a new marriage. All right? That's what basically what eisegesis is. If, if, my, uh, if I were to treat my current wife like my ex-wife or like my mother or like my sister or if I were to presume that because I've seen other women do something that she would also do it, there's this categorical, impersonal, unloving overlay to which I would subject her unfairly, all right? We do that to the Bible all the time. We subject the Bible to this categorical, unloving overlay that we've gotten from elsewhere. So the Calvinist says, the scripture acknowledges that there should be a rule of interpretation. That's why it says, rightly dividing the word of truth, which is hilarious to see that come out of a Calvinist's mouth. And he has a rule of interpretation. Whenever you ask, I've never asked a Calvinist, Oh, uh, how do you interpret scripture and gotten a good answer back? I've never gotten a good answer. They're always, what they do is it's a while before they come back and they had to go Google something from gotquestions.org. And the, well, I use, I use the historic redemptive method of interpretation. No, you don't. You just Googled that. What's a good Calvinist interpretation model? They Googled that and came back and said that and they can't explain it to you. Well, I use Van Til's presuppositional apologetics. What's that, pray tell? They can't tell you. They have no idea what it is. They're, they're using these words like a rule of interpretation. They cannot tell you. Like the idea, the, the, the OP that he made shows that he has no idea what biblical interpretation is. He doesn't even know where he's starting. He doesn't even know where he is. It's like he's wearing a blindfold and he played that little game where you ran, run, run three circles around a baseball bat and then try to run a race. That's what he's doing. That's where he is permanently <laughs> because of his because of his paradigm. So he goes on, what you are saying is that is what has led to the bastardization of scripture, especially in Pentecostalism. Now, that's a tall order to say the bastardization of scripture, which is exactly what he is doing, right? Because he thinks that mapping a meaning of a buzzword onto everywhere it appears is not the bastardization of scripture, which is exactly what it is. And then he lists something like Pentecostalism. That's supposed to be some kind of label boogeyman. And sometimes, like, this one isn't even a bad one, but a lot of times they try to, they try to map you to Bethel or Pelagius or Arminianism or work salvation or Mormonism or Jehovah's Witnesses or David Koresh, all right? 
uh, the guy who the guy who could not even give the gospel to the atheist dude, De- Derek Murrell, was on, uh, <laughs> or Morrell, however his name is pronounced, was on. He 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 used to always try to map me to David Koresh because a Calvinist can't do any better than try to map you to something that's got a known negative connotation to it. Okay, so that's what he's trying to do here. He's trying to map somebody to a trying to map me to a known negative connotation. But I think you should, by the scripture, demonstrate your point. Show me how a word is different in meaning because of the difference in context. Now, anybody who would ever ask that, it's appalling. It's appalling to good sense that anybody would ever ask that. (laughs) If anybody thinks that a word is exactly the same regardless of context... They shouldn't be able to go to the grocery store unsupervised. I'm, I'm surprised that they're allowed to walk out in public freely. And maybe he can't. I don't know. That way I'll understand the extent of what you were saying, that systematic theology is wrong. And it's not that any particular systematic theology has wrong propositions in it, which they do. It's that the concept of, of vying for systematic theology in the first place is a bad idea it's procedurally bad for a lot of different reasons, okay? And we have a video, a, a very recent, recent video, why all systematic theology is bad or wrong. I forget the title of it, right? You would think it's my video, I would know, but I don't. So I responded quite the opposite. Mapping single words to systematic doctrines is the bastardization of Scripture. Here are some examples. The phrase, the faith, in Galatians 1.23 is a reference to content, kind of like a body of knowledge. The phrase, the faith, same phrase in Galatians 2.16, is a bond of fidelity associated with Christ. This faith is a subcomponent of the faith in 1.23 because your fidelity associated with Christ would be included in the body of knowledge content of the word, the faith. It's also not obvious from the grammar whether Christ is the object of or the generator of this faith in 2.16, faith of Christ. Of course, ideology would produce a ready-made biased answer, i.e. we know what a Calvinist must say about certain passages prior to examination of the passage of content. No thinking or exegetical work is required to derive their theology, uh, what their theology compels them to conclude a priori of investigation. In other words, before you conduct an investigation, you already know what a Calvinist has to say about any passage. You already know what a Calvinist has to say about 1 John 2, 2, before you ever look at the passage or compare it or do any investigation whatsoever. You already know that, right? Uh, you know what that's called when you have your mind made up before the investigation? That's called prejudice. That's what that is, it's prejudice, all right? So systematic theology, whether it's provisionist or Calvinist, makes people prejudice. That's not how you want to be. My child had the word prejudice as a vocabulary word, and it was defined as a racial thing, like generalizing people because of race. No, 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 no. Prejudice is having your mind made up about anything before investigating it. And sometimes you can be against somebody um, that fits a certain criteria for good reasons. Now, I'm not saying that race is a good reason. I'm not saying that at all. But I'm just saying that um, being negatively disposed towards something or someone doesn't mean that it's prejudicial. It could be post-judicial, but it's being characterized uh, the other way around. The faith of 2 Corinthians 13.5 is something that people are supposed to be in rather than it being in them. Which goes against the premise of his OP. And therefore is obvious agency and responsibility on the part of the individual to make this determination. That does not go good with Calvinistic doctrine. The faith of Galatians... (laughs) Because if you're in the faith, then you would be able to know. If you're not in the faith, you wouldn't have... Uh, the faculties by which you could determine whether you were, because, you know, the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. So it's, uh, these passages wouldn't make any sense if Calvinism were true. The faith of Galatians 3.23, that's 21. If you need a reminder, Galatians 3.23, before faith came, and then 25, after that faith has come. Okay? 
Um, the faith of Galatians 3.23 was definitely not something that was revealed in Deuteronomy or even in John 6, right? Because Acts 17.31, and that he, hath ra- he had given assurance unto all men and that he hath raised him from the dead. Wouldn't you think that's a game changer? Remember Jesus said, if I be lifted up, uh, I will draw all men to me in John 12, 32. Don't you think that's a game changer? That's a game changer. And so if you, all your proof texts are coming out of John 6, where this hasn't even happened yet, you're anachronistically thinking. You're bringing a bunch of baggage into the text, which is causing you to fail to realize the basic narrative and timeline, the sequence of events, and the very important events that on which your faith relies, no pun intended, haven't even happened yet. And that's where you're getting your proof text. It would therefore be asinine to take the appearance of the word faith in Deuteronomy and map it the same way as it appears in the Pauline Revelation. Okay? So he's taking faith in Deuteronomy 32 and putting it right beside something in 2 Thessalonians like it's the same thing. Cannot possibly be the same thing. When you look at Galatians 3, 23 through 25, all right, only someone who's in, in Acts 17, 31. Now, this may sound like I'm just bashing a Calvinist here. I'm not showing that slide anymore, am I? This is what I showed a second ago. I forgot to switch back and forth between my visual aids here. Um, I'm not just bashing Calvinism here. What we're doing is this is kind of a practical and biblical interpretation on what to do with words as they appear in the text. <clears throat> so it would therefore be asinine to take the appearance of the word faith in Deuteronomy and map it the same way as it appears in the Pauline Revelation. You can't map both occurrences of the word faith back to your systematic uh, dogma. Okay? It doesn't work that way. You have to put it in the context in which it appears. Only someone who's completely divorced from the flow and content of Scripture would entertain such a notion at all, much less engage in sophistry based on that mistake. So he comes back and says, and we're almost done with this, I understand and agree with your point. However, the root definition of the word faith didn't change in all the passages you cited, though used in different senses, and also consistently positive. To explain what I mean is when one looks at the word truth for faith, one looks at the word truth, for faith is belief in the truth. The word, now, he says the word of God here, but he thinks faith is affirmation of certain propositions that are must be presumed in faith to be factual. Because that's what a paradigmatic person does. That's why it's both substance and evidence of hope not yet seen. A body of truths, he's still thinking of propositions, statements that are presumed to be factual, will still be called the truth. You can be in the truth, he thinks, he's thinking a set of propositions, and the truth can be in you, a set of propositions. You've internalized this. You can also belong to the truth of the truth. There was a time the truth came to you, and the truth belongs to the same person who is the embodiment of truth. So he thinks the truth coming to you is a set of propositions you're getting exposure to, which is not it. Because propositions can only point toward truth. We can see that truth can be used in different senses, but the meaning remains the such. Such, then, would be the word faith, which is the belief in of the truth. And he, he's belief in a set of propositions, is what he's thinking. So, I, this is the last one I'm going to share with you. I put in, faith can also be fidelity to a person or fidelity to something of concern. Now, truthfulness and truths are different concepts. Both insinuate correspondence with reality, but the words that form the propositions describing the truths are never the actual truths. Because remember, propositional knowledge is the currency of knowledge. It's never real knowledge. They can only point at them. Faith in sets of propositions is not faith in actual truths. It's a faux faith in things intended to symbolize truths, but which can only do so in a manner that is also characterized by severe data compression. It's important to fully understand the four kinds of truths, knowledge, before attempting to delve into the realm into the realm unprepared. So what are those four kinds of truths? There's propositional knowledge, there's procedural, perspectival, and participatory. All right, and that was in my set of answers. So I recommend that you understand this with regard. I want you to be thinking about this kind of thing with regard to a word like faith. 
I can never stress it enough. And I, it's hard for me to gather what people are getting from the text or what people are getting from these videos because I say things over and over like never take a buzzword definition and bring it onto the text. And, and I get a lot of people like agreeing with that concept but because there's so many different people watching YouTube videos all the time, I also get a bunch of people who are still doing it. So it's uh, the saturation of procedural knowledge of biblical interpretation here is it's hard to it's hard to measure. It's hard to account for. But in in Acts 17:31, this assurance, what happened with Jesus dying and Rising again is a game changer for everything. It's a game changer for everything. Before faith came, after faith came. Christ Jesus is the object of our faith. He is the, he is the embodiment of everything that... Uh, what do I say next? <clears throat> According to 1 John 2 and... John 17. In John 17, let me go there real quick. Jesus is praying. Neither pray for, I, for these alone, but for them which shall believe on me through their word. So what is he praying for first? He's praying for the given, the 12 apostles. But they also shall believe on me through their word. He's praying for them. Well, those are just the believers still, that they may all be one as thou, Father, art in me and I in thee, that they may be one in us, that the world, all right, so stop there. Do we really believe that? Do we really believe that we can be one in Christ and the Father and one with them? Jesus said, I and the Father are one. If this prayer got answered, couldn't you say that too? I and the Father are one. Couldn't you say that? Sounds blasphemous, doesn't it? That it sounds blasphemous because of your baggage, not because of infidelity to the text. Think about that. Why? That the world might believe that thou hast sent me. That's the same world that he wasn't praying for in John 17, 9. Because he needs his people to get their act together first. Why? So that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. And the glory which thou gavest me, I have given them. All right. So are you one with Christ and the Father? It's a very important question to ask. In 1 John chapter 2, verse 20, it says, You have an unction from the Holy One, and you know all things. That word unction is chrisma, which is really close to Christos. Same root word. Okay? The anointing. The anointing. Christ means the anointed one, and ye have an anointing, is basically what he's saying. In other words, you are a little Christ. That's what Christian means, by the way. Every time you say Christian, you're saying a little Christ. We are little Christs. We are, we are anointed also. This is that light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. He is the prime archetypal example of that anointing, but it lights every man that cometh into the world. And the point, one of the points of Jesus Christ is to realize the light that's in him is the same light that's in you. That's the point you got to get. I have not written unto you because you know not the truth, but because you know it and that no lie is of the truth. What is he talking about there? He's not talking about propositions. He's not talking about propositions like this. He's talking about things that correspond with reality and things that don't correspond with reality. And because of the light of the consciousness that's in you, which is the same consciousness that's in Christ, you can separate the signal from the noise on these matters. And you can determine what is in correspondence with reality and what is not in correspondence with reality. And like, like Verveke's term, um, continuity of contact, fidelity, faith, is to main continuity of, maintain continuity of contact continuity of contact with that which is of concern and your commitment to main continuity of contact in any realm. It could be making sure your cat is well taken care of. It could be continuity of contact with things at your work, with your wife, with the house that you own and need to take care of. 
continuity of contact with the things that are of concern to you. Who is a liar but he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ? He is Antichrist that denieth the Father and the Son. Whosoever denieth the Son, the same hath the, not the Father, but he that acknowledgeth the Son, the same hath the Father also. Isn't that interesting? Because I and the Father are one. Let that therefore abide where? In you, which ye have heard from the beginning. If that which ye have heard from the beginning shall remain in you, ye shall also continue in the Son and in the Father. Because I and the Father are one. And this is the promise that he hath promised us, even eternal life. These things have I written unto you concerning them that seduce you. Because there's people out there seducing. But the anointing. What's that word anointing? The same word that was used for unction. Chrisma. So there's Christ, the anointed one. There's Chrisma, the anointing. Right? Now some Christian traditions talk about, you know, Lord, pray that you anoint us. You don't. You don't get, you, <laughs> anointing isn't something that you, you get every other week or something like that. Anointing is something that's innately there. It's just there, all right? It's always there. The anointing which you have received of him abideth where? In you. And ye need not that any man teach you, but as the same anointing teacheth you of all things, and is truth, and is no lie, even as it hath taught you, ye shall abide in him. That's uh, We really need to grasp onto these concepts. We really need to grasp them. I don't think we grasp them. So this concept of faith. Because he hath appointed a day in which he will judge the word, world in righteousness by the man he, whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men, and that he hath raised him from the dead. So the resurrection of the dead and the pistis, the assurance, that what? He's going to judge the world in righteousness. Now, that might sound bad to you, but I want you to see, whenever you see the righteous judge, I want you to envision yourself as one of the oppressed people who, for you, everything will be set right, okay? If your business got burned down in Milwaukee, and it's not fair that the same people who let you let them burn down the businesses in Milwaukee uh, were also um, arresting people who were going to churches one year later, it doesn't make a lot of sense, does it? Well, Christ's going to come show up and set all this stuff right. You see? He's going he's to be the righteous judge. He's going to set all this stuff right. By that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men, and that he hath raised him from the dead. All men. And in the context of this, is for in him we live, move, and have our beings, as certain also of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. The Christ's. The resurrection of Christ gives assurance, gives faith, gives pistons, gives gives pistis to all men. All right, let me look at the context before we go, or the comments before we go here. Everyone still holds the beliefs about everything they don't re-examine, so it doesn't matter denomination or not. All right, now what we want to do is separate ourselves from beliefs and get more into believing on, believing in. Right? I'm glad I wasn't raised in a denomination. Those who have been raised in this or that denomination usually hold on to at least some of that denomination's specific teachings even when they actively try to free themselves of it. I would agree with that. And so um, ridding yourselves of presuppositions is a lifelong journey um, of which I have no claims that I'm doing well with, but I recognize that it needs to be done. Feedback for you, we can't throw away any paradigms, patterns, models that easily. It's continuous renewal, but at some point we don't re-examine things for various reasons. And absolutely, it's not easy to do. Not easy to do at all. He <laughs> spelled it Baton Rouge style. Now, you should know, remember I fixed this before having that pointed out. But, well, it was pointed out in the red underlining. Yeah, it was, it was Baton Rouge style. That's exactly right. Exactly what I did. So thanks, Kayla, for the super chat. She says, off topic, but have you ever taken the big five personality test? I'm curious how that test ties into ideological possession. So when I've taken a lot of personality tests, like the Myers-Briggs stuff and the Four Lenses stuff, and I got involved in a lot of this stuff. I spent a period of my life about four years ago where I was accused of being a narcissist. And so I was really worried about that. <laughs> so I went 
to a bunch of counselors, took a bunch of tests, and I had some professionals tell me that, no, you're definitely not a narcissist. You have way too much empathy to be a narcissist. You were being gaslit by somebody who has their own problems. So yeah, I've delved into this a good bit. Now, the big five would be openness, conscientiousness, extroversion, agreeableness, and neuroticism, okay? And how how does that tie into ideological possession? I, I don't know how that would tie into ideological possession, but I would guess that the more open somebody is, the less prone they are to ideological possession. But the problem with that is that the more open somebody is, the more impressionable they are too, okay? Which could, on the other end of openness, take them into ideological possession just the same, okay? Conscientiousness, it depends on where you apply that conscientiousness. If you're try, You could apply conscientiousness to trying to make money or you could apply it to... Ep- um, epistemology you, it depends on where you apply your conscientiousness and then your disagreeableness really plays into like most calvinists most calvinist apologists are males and males are higher in disagreeability that's why there's more males in jail and at the end of the distribution of agreeableness the most agreeable people are women and the most disagreeable people are men if you look at the bell curves of men and women on disagreeableness and disagreeableness in my opinion uh, there's a lot of disagreeability for no good reason when you look at calvinists as you find them online okay now i know that face to face might be a different story but it might not i don't know but there's some really i mean like the really boneheaded calvinists that are out there and uh, and provisionalists too they're they're men but men tend to be men tend to be interested in things while women tend to be interested in people so in my experience this is just anecdotal but a woman tends to be more fluid with what the beliefs are of the denomination and they're more interested in being there to interact with the people to feel fulfilled socially and a lot of things like that whereas the man tends to be more focused on you know, left hemispheric slicing all this stuff up in a certain way. So it'd be interesting. I, I don't have any scientific data to answer this question for you, but it would be very interesting to maybe have a, a panel discussion on this with other people who are familiar with the big five personality traits. And perhaps trait neuroticism, yeah, I could see that playing a big role too. People might feel more secure and less negatively emotional if they have some paradigm giving them assurance, even if it wasn't warranted in the paradigm. Huh. But it it could also, because of the, because the paradigm rendering people ineffective, it could also render them more uh, nihilistic because they recognize that they have no agency in life after committing so much time to this paradigm. Wow. So that's, that's a very good set of thought processes provoked by that question so i appreciate you asking it um all racism is prejudice but not all prejudice is racism i would disagree with that um i would say that not all racism is prejudice depending well i would say that all racism is bad but i'm not so sure that prejudice is the is the motivating factor there it's hard to find those shining or sending people that I really want to meet one I'm not sure what that's a reference to because I'm reading these backwards an opportunity to grow and exercise love for Jesus it is difficult not without a football helmet a mattress rope to his back I actually got into a verbal shuffle scuffle with a Calvinist clown that tries to get attention by attacking Mike Winger he just about burst a blood vessel when I questioned some quote of Spurgeon's yeah they they are man worshippers, and when you when you uh, question their heroes and their idols, they they strip out their gears and burn up their clutch plate pretty fast. Calvinist emailer is projecting, and this was on Facebook, not an emailer, but yeah, he's definitely projecting. <laughs> 
And I, yeah, Derek, what a who. And I wouldn't have mentioned his name if he wasn't, if the exchange to which I was referring wasn't al already in public. Because I don't bring things out from private groups out into the public. Um, another super chat. Wow, Monique, fan character jumping in the air in front of a big red heart, pom pom in their hands. So that's a, apparently an emoji that would have showed up if I was looking at this on YouTube, which I'm not looking at. But anyway, I'll look at that later. But I appreciate the super chat, Monique. Sounds like an echo chamber is one of the biggest problems. Once they find out I don't acknowledge any label, they usually try to stick one on me. Pelagian is probably the most common. That's exactly what they do. They they cannot think, so they have to stick a label on you. All right, just answer this. Believe the Bible, bro. Let's see what else we have. A text without a context is a pretext to a proof text. All right. Thanks, Shredhead, for the super chat. Let's see if we have any super chats, and we'll... Any more super chats? And I think we already saw this one. Thanks, Jamie. And Jamie sent another one too. So thanks for that. I know some people have to go because they got their own church services and whatnot. But I'm glad you were here with us. And we will continue our series on the book of Acts. In the meantime, uh, well, I guess we could just, you know, go ahead and say this here. Um, Remember, we are on Facebook. Like us on Facebook at Beyond the Fundamentals. Remember to like the video, subscribe, share these videos, hit the bell icon. If you want to support us financially, you can do so at Kevin at BeyondTheFundamentals.com is the, is the email address associated with our LLC PayPal. And then uh, Venmo is Kevin-Thompson at four, uh, hyphen 418 at Venmo.com. And why we do this, if you want to screenshot this, to facilitate growth beyond what is available in the epidemic of dysfunctional institutional church models. That's why we are doing this. So thanks for watching. May the Lord bless you and good day.